Cami Maddox from the James Cancer Hospital, and I'm accompanied today by Dr. Pierluigi Parku from Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, Dr. Pamela Allen from Winship Cancer Center, and Dr. Jonathan Friedberg from Wilmot Cancer Center. And we're here today to have a discussion on the treatment landscape in diffuse large B cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. Let's kind of have the same discussion on follicular lymphoma. What are some of your thoughts on the bispecific antibodies that we, the data we've seen in follicular lymphoma? I mean, I think there it's, um, we're optimistic that we're gonna see an approval of uh, mosinituzumab within the next few weeks of, of this recording. Um, at least the FDA is considering it uh, before the end of the calendar year. Uh, so I think that you know, implies that there's a, a reasonable efficacy base. Um, and the, the question then is, you know, when do you use it? And of course, this is a disease where, as we talked about you know, just earlier, it's so heterogeneous and, um, you know, but I think having that as an option for patients, you know, who maybe have progressed after chemoimmunotherapy and lenalidomide-based therapy, um, whether it's used before or after CAR T-cell therapy, and we're still learning about the optimal use of CAR T-cell therapy in follicular lymphoma, but I think this will be another important tool that um, will be, uh, looked at earlier and earlier in subsets of patients with follicular lymphoma as well. I think, you know, maybe even more exciting in follicular just from the standpoint of um, in large cell you're willing to tolerate a little more toxicity, but it's nice to have these when you're looking at the option of this in CAR-T um, in follicular lymphoma where maybe your, you know, mm -hmm. patients have more options, live longer, you're not. And mosinituzumab um, at, at present is infusional, but uh, the company is working on a uh, subcutaneous <coughs> formulation, and it's uh, expected that that will be what's uh, used. And with that approach, um, at least we're told that the uh, risk of CRS or hospitalization is very low. Um, and that you know, may be striking that balance that you were asking for. Yeah. What about some of the CAR products? I mean, so again, you know, the CV19 CARs are effective in follicular. I think it's a challenge to decide what are the right patients for, for those products right now. Um, I don't know if you guys want to maybe comment on where you see it, the current product approval use and any products that you see as um, exciting in this area. I'm a bit concerned about the durability of CAR-T in follicular as compared to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, we don't have the length of follow-up and the studies are smaller. Um, but if you look at the curves, they don't appear to be quite flattening like they did in large cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And you know, that could be disappointing because I think we'd, we'd like to think that it's definitive treatment if we use it. Um, I think right now we think about it at our institution and in patients with early progression um, who have you know, aggressive clinical courses or the multiply relapse setting. Young, maybe you know, that with yeah. a high tumor burden, you know, younger patients, those are tough uh, with follicular lymphoma. Agree. Yeah, patients that have relapsed, especially if they've relapsed like within a year of chemotherapy, um, you know, are certainly a high risk cohort that we that we certainly worry about. But I think the other benefit of CAR T is that it's not a long duration of therapy; it's like one mm -hmm. time. <clears throat> so. For where, where I am, a lot of times patients travel quite far to come see me, so it's nice to be able to give something that you can give you know, in the hospital and then let them, let them go back to the community. I think in the you know, multiple relapse, young patients and in the POD24, it's a nice option, but I agree. I think you know, we're not seeing that durability necessarily, or it looks like we might not be that we see in some of the patients with large cell. I think, uh, as, as you were implying, the, the toxicity, though, appears to be less than in large cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So whether that's an indicator of you know, immune fitness and you need a little bit more uh, activation to get these cars to work, it's not clear to me. But um, you know, at least it's been our experience that most of the patients with follicular lymphoma almost fly through the treatment. Uh, what about some of the other therapies, anything from monoclonals, um, antibody drug conjugates, or even oral therapies here that you think is exciting? The, the uh, long castuximab data, I think, are looking pretty good, um, both in terms of efficacy as well as safety. Um, I think it's, a, you know, we still need to see the durability of some of those uh, responses. Um, I tend to think of uh, um, 
uh, antibody drug conjugates as a, a, a variant of chemotherapy to some degree more than just really sort of immunotherapy. Um, so in terms of you know, uh, you know, resistance to therapy, failure after chemotherapy, um, but the data are promising, so I think uh, that that's another uh, drug to keep an eye on. Mentioned earlier the tazimetastat. It's a very tolerable drug. So when mm -hmm. we're talking about in terms of ability to um, be able to tolerate side effects, that, that's another therapy that is reasonable. So my provocative <laughs> comment number two <laughs> is uh, you know mentioning the category of drugs called PI3 kinase inhibitors, oh, yeah. uh, which I think somewhat sadly, um, yeah. we, we know across many different drugs in that class had significant activity in follicular lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that all of us at the table have uh, individual patients we can think of who really benefited from that uh, drug class. Mm -hmm. And largely because of toxicities and other diseases that were observed, um, that drug class has virtually disappeared with the exception of Copan Lisib. Um, but at this meeting, uh, Zandalisib and some other new schedules and strategies of PI3 kinase inhibitors appear to be still under development, and to some degree a resurrection of that in a careful, thoughtful way I think would serve the field well. I completely agree. I think that was unfortunate because, you know, they're, they do work well in some patients and some do tolerate them well, and, you know, it's nice to have those options.